Whoa, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm great, Kevin. It's so nice to sort of meet you. Excellent to sort of meet uh, by this format. I've been meeting so many people socially distant uh, this yeah. way as of late. It's very responsible of us, though. We're doing the, we're doing <laughs> know, the good right? thing. My, my name's Chris. Um, usually, I would have a big fancy introduction to, uh, to, to bring you on here, but I don't think that's necessary. Everybody knows that Kevin Smith. So, hi, everybody. It's Kevin Smith. Hey, um, everybody. I don't know that everybody knows him. But, oh, I'm blocking the camera. I don't know that everybody knows him, but everybody sure has an opinion of him and stuff. And whatever your opinion is, it don't matter, kids, because we're going to be talking comic books. Is that what we're talking today? We can talk about anything you want. I saw you just did a 90-hour fast. That's intense. Oh, wait. What happens if I if I turn the phone this way? Did I go weird for you guys? You just look sideways. It sideways? Yeah, it's sideways. Man, let me try to stand this up so I can talk hands free. I see your hands free. I'm usually holding it. Uh, yeah, I, we I did. Just, I, did I uh... have my cell phone propped up on my uh, on my computer. It's nothing. It's nothing but, neat or, or or fancy. It's just a just a little. I think that's what I just wound up doing. I defaulted to that. Um, oh, sweet. Well, this is perfect. I, went, I was trying to do a 72 hour fast, and then my fast ended at eight o'clock at night, and I generally don't eat past like eight o'clock. So I was like, well, I'll, I'll wait until tomorrow morning. And so I wound up eating at 10 o'clock. So it was like a 90 uh, hour fast. And it was fantastic. I feel great. Uh, I've talked about it on Twitter. And then a bunch of people, of course, had opinions on, on it and stuff. But um, it's not like uh, the big misconception everyone uh, kind of comes up with is like your your body goes into starvation mode and it, you just start devouring your own muscles. It's like not no. true at all. Well, no, it releases like growth hormone and all sorts of stuff. I know I'm a big fan of fasting. I love that's, fasting. The, the growth hormone like uh, info just hit my radar within the last week. I've been intermittent fasting since the heart attack because I just was eating too much. I wanted to bring my weight down and stuff. So I would always feel like you know people would be like, "Wow, you look younger," and I was like, "Well, I guess I lost weight and contracted, so maybe that's why I look younger." But then after watching this video the other day, I realized it's it's like they your body releases stem cells, regenerative stem cells yeah. uh, when you're in fasting mode, like because we're so not used to ever shutting the system down, although right. lately that's all we've been doing. But like the body and stuff, everyone's like three meals a day and you don't need that. That's just yeah. way too much food. Well, it's, so, it's yeah, not it was, how, it's not how humans developed. I mean, it was always feast or famine. We would eat for like like a big meal and then we would go two or three days hunting or something and we wouldn't have food again you know so so I, anyways i could go on and on about all that let's let's talk comic books that's what they want to talk about stuff like that i know you've been really busy uh in quarantine you uh you just finished the script for twilight of the mall rats congratulations thank you i'm trying to still trying to find my best angle um i did i'm dropping lower now um I did. We, uh, I was sitting around and, and for the first few weeks, you know, I just kind of quarantined it like everybody else where I was like, what's going to happen? I'm scared. Let's just watch old TV that we love and stuff and comfort eat. So, you know, I'm vegan, but still sugar is vegan. So I was pounding on a lot of like vegan ice cream and stuff. So I, I you know, I, I tried to rediscipline instead of sitting around and eating and watching other people's stuff. I was like, I'll work on my stuff. Because when you're working on your stuff, you don't tend to eat anyway. Like when I'm yeah. writing, I don't, I'll write for like 15 hours and never leave the room and not think about eating. But if I'm watching TV, it, that's Pavlovian to me. Instantly, I'm like, I got to be chowing down. Well, you know what will make this better? Just eating for two hours straight as I watch this. So right. I had to break that cycle. So I was like, I'll just bury myself in the office and and write because that way like at, at the end of the day i'm killing two birds with one stone I'm getting something done staying away from food and also there's a part of me that like whenever i watch stuff whenever i watch somebody else's entertainment and i'm being entertained there's this weird guilty voice in the back of my head that's like well right now you could be making your own art like the same way you're sitting here consuming somebody else's art and whatnot like you know how fun it is to make your own and you're just sitting yeah. here watching somebody else's and then I'm, then I'm like, oh, I should go make something and then go right. work on something else. So it's been productive. I did the first draft of Twilight of the Mallrats. Everybody who's on the poster comes back. 
um, it, and who and I said someplace on Twitter I was answering questions, and I didn't mention Shannon Hamilton. That was Ben's character, but Shannon Hamilton's character comes back. They all come oh, back. Oh, sweet! That was I was going to ask that. I'm super excited to hear that. I want to know what that guy's up to these days. Yeah, whether or not he wants to do it, I don't know. But right now, <laughs> this Shannon Hamilton's in the script. Um, but uh, it's it's fun, man. It's beautiful, uh, funny movie. Um, it closely resembles Mallrats in as much as like the structure and almost the right. scene by scene beat uh, is is you know I I've had the benefit. I mean, most people when they make a sequel, they're doing it like you know a year after. The first one came out and they're capitalizing on its success. But um, I've had the benefit of like that movie's been out for 25 years. So I know exactly what people like about it. You know, right. like the beats to hit. It's not guesswork on like, well, you know, it, it, some things like take a long time to gestate and become like uh, classic bits and stuff. Some of them are baked in classics by this point, 25 years in. Not like we tried, but just by virtue of the fact that I've been watching that movie since I was a kid and him sailing right. through the air. That's like hysterical, even though I'm like, wow, that's, that's so old at this point. So knowing that in writing Twilight of the Mallrats, like you can play it like an instrument as opposed to guessing it like I would have if we made a Mallrats 2, like one year after Mallrats. Right. Now I, I can really shape and, and sh strategically put together what is what I would consider to be as a Kevin Smith fan like a really worthy sequel to Mallrats. Well, speaking of things that love about the people, things that people love about the original Mallrats um, is the Stan Lee cameo. Obviously, I mean, he can't be in it now, but do you have anything written that sort of like commemorates him for that movie? We have a Stan Lee scene. Um, okay. Obviously, Stan Lee won't be in it because Stan's past, but same Brody beat and and it's a bit and Stan plays like a big part of it. So there's a I, as a as a as a writer, like, you know, I my daughter hates like how into myself and my writing I am. But sometimes like as a writer, I'm like, oh, that was clever. That's yeah. clever and stuff like where you want to share it with people. But you're like, I'll wait until I can give it to everybody at once and stuff. But there, the Stan Lee scene in Twilight of the Mallrats is one of those moments that I consider like, oh, that's clever. And even yeah. if I wasn't me and I just liked my movies, I would be like, that's a good, what a what a way to do it, man. So it's pretty, pretty special. And Stan, even though he's not with us, kind of looms throughout the movie because Brody, when we come to him 25 years later, is still talking about the best day of his life, which we all know is the movie Mallrats. Right. And it's kind of what the movie's about. Like, what happens when you peak real early, you mm -hmm. know? And like, but it's it's very biographical, autobiographical, um, in as much as Brody's one moment in the sun on the game show on local cable access, which turned him into the Tonight Show host for like a tiny bit of time, um, is something he, like he talks about for the rest of his fucking life. And he's built his entire career and empire on it. That's like clerks for me. So yes. as I was writing this movie, I was just stealing liberally from my life. And like, you know, there's Brody's married, of course, to Renee, uh, Shannon Doherty's character. And they got a kid, Banner, who if you saw Jane Silent Bob reboot in the cut, uh, in the cut scenes that were playing in the credits, mm -hmm. he mentions Banner Bruce and stuff like that. So his, his name is Brody Bruce. His daughter's name is Banner Bruce. So in that, there's like uh, discussions between the whole family about how the whole world is like in Brody's mind, it's Brody's world and everyone's focused on him and shit. And they live in a Brody museum because it's pictures of Brody and shit he's done throughout his entire life. And, you know, I just liberally stole from my own life because these are the things I've heard from my wife and my kid for like the last 15 years. Like, right. you know, we just kind of live in a world that's all about you. Does I'm like, no, no, it's just, it just pays for all of this. That's all. <laughs> so I know that we're both like huge Daredevil fans. And so we actually got the chance to talk to Charlie Cox the other day. And we were talking to him about the being in Spider-Man 3. And he said that if, if the rumors are true, that it would be a different actor. So I saw I, that. I know I was... the chances are slim to none, but I love the 2003 Daredevil. And so if Ben showed up in the MCU as Daredevil, 
because uh, they kind of set the precedent with Jay Jonah, right? So that's true. I, they've crossed the stream. They've crossed streams exactly. So uh, true or false? You think fans would flip their lid if Ben Affleck showed up as Daredevil in the I, MCU? I think, it, I think it would create a double hit as well, man. Because not only is it like, oh, this cat played the old Daredevil. But it's Batman, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I know. So, you know, you'd be like one of us. Like, they'd drag a, a DC guy over to the Marvel side. So there's many benefits to having it be Ben. The chances of that happening, oh, very yeah. unlikely. Very Although, but be never the Marvel never. Universe, and the Marvel Universe did suck in Matt. Like, Matt popped up in a cameo. Yes. But he wasn't he, he wasn't DC's Batman. Well, also, I mean, who would have thought they were going to bring Jay Jonah from the original Raimi trilogy in there, you know? So Stroke of Genius and also, mm -hmm. like, a fan favorite. Like, a, a <laughs> moment where Kevin Feige was sitting there going, you know what they're going to love? This. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, like, it's not like he's gone away. I mean, heavens. Like, uh, right. he's been with us forever. Yeah. I uh, Speaking of Ben as Batman, I know you've been quoted as saying that you know that the Justice, uh, the Justice League Snyder Cut is a real thing. So can I uh, possibly ask how you might know that? I, 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 not, I, and I've said many times that I don't, I, I, and even on Fat Man Beyond, I think I've said, like, I don't know that there's a, there's a physical oh, copy that one okay. could sit down with. But I know that there's a lot of that movie that he made, and then it got completely fucked right. with um and i know this not from zach himself and not from ben i've never spoken to them about it right but um in england when i was visiting the star wars set there was a bunch of crew that like when, whenever i'm i'm around like i don't attract famous people i attract crew like because they're <laughs> like oh my god you've been doing this right. i saw clerks and that made me want to be in the business and stuff so it's really sweet so I get to gossip with people who work on the shows and you find out about stuff that's on going on in the show that you're currently at. Mm -hmm. But you also find out stuff about the shows they've worked on prior to that. So a bunch of people who worked on uh, Rise of Skywalker when I visited had worked on like uh, Justice League, uh, had worked on Solo as well. So not only are you getting in the trenches war stories about the movie they're making mm -hmm. you get in the trenches war stories about the movies they made so i was talking to some cats who were in uh visual effects um who had been in visual effects on justice league who saw the boards laid out for, they said very elaborate boards some of them drawn by jim lee that laid out the three movies oh of, wow like that they were going to make. And then uh, somewhere it became two. But the idea was, I guess the three movies were, you know, Batman v Superman, Justice League 1, and Justice League 2. So right. there was a vision for this grand universe. He said he saw Martian Manhunter on it. He said he saw Green Lanterns and stuff like that. So it, it, he broke down the script that he got to read, the movie that they shot originally, um, and then the movie that we saw. And that was where I first heard about like this, the Snyder, what would become colloquially the Snyder cut at this point from okay. people that worked on the movie, special effects people that were like, dude, dark side was in it. This was in it. They went through everything. And I was like, no. And then we did an episode of fat man beyond. And we were reading some internet piece about like, uh, you know, somebody who heard that dark side was in it. And someone in our audience, uh, Jamie Catters, who goes to all the shows that, that we do there, she had gone to a, a test screening. Mm -hmm. So she saw a version that had stuff in it that she essentially saw the Snyder Cut version before they, I guess, did the reshoot. Because she described things that were still, they included them as like rough drawings and stuff like that but told right. the audience this isn't you know finished by any stretch of the imagination and some of the stuff that she described was dark side and was like this much grander vision for the movie than it had and you know i i'm not i like i i think i'm not like the person that's just like i love Zack snyder's version i have lots of respect for Zack snyder's version of, of batman v superman and and I don't, we've never apparently seen his version of Justice League. Um, but like he had a take and you could clearly tell that he was going in a direction with that take. And we'd seen the, the vision 
in right. Man of Steel, which was a wonderful film. Uh, we've seen the vision continue in Batman v Superman. The opening sequence is spellbinding and ties uh, directly into Man of Steel. And, and his vision for this universe is incredibly serious. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying there's no jokes in it. Yes, there's humor, but right. it's treated insanely earnestly. The way that when I was in my teens reading comics, I was like, why can't they make the movies like this? Why can't they mm -hmm. make them all serious? So his tone is present in Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and then falls off the cliff in Justice League. And, you know, as a, just as a, I'm, believe me, I'm not gonna say fellow filmmaker because Zach's way better than me at making films, but as a guy who makes movies, it's sad to see somebody's vision interrupted. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. he, whether he was doing a thing and it was his thing. And just because I wasn't like, oh, that's the best version of that thing ever. I still had lots of respect for her. I was like, that's a cool thing. And I honestly would like to see the story continued and concluded. Like we right. were in the middle of this operatic, like God of Damarang version of the DC universe. I, I would like to see how that was going to conclude rather than, you know, uh, pardon us, here's a whole different director and different tone, you know, yeah. and suddenly the movie shifts. And I understand why it happened and all the reasons and stuff. But, you know, you got a, a director, Zach seems to be very willing to go back and present like what his vision would be. And I know I would be too. If somebody like took my movie away from me and completely changed it. Oh, sure. better leave. I'd be yeah. sitting online being like, here, check this out. I'd invite people over my house to watch the thing just to be like, this is what I wanted to do. So it makes it makes absolute sense that he's still engaged with it. He never got to tell the story that he wanted to tell. Um, right. So I, I understand that like everyone's in support of like the Snyder Cut, but it's not like here's a DVD this has the Snyder cut on it. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. There's yeah, yeah. no completed version of the movie. It's not a tape trade that you guys are passing around or anything like that. Right. Well, I, I mean, maybe it is amongst the power elite in this town stuff, but the way I've always understood it from people who've seen it is that it's like a, a big chunk and then description of things that weren't mm -hmm. shot or needed to be changed and then another chunk. So it's not like you could just put it up on line and everybody could watch it coherently. Even movie fans or people who are cineasts who are like, oh, I understand storyboards and stuff like that, might have a harder time getting through it. No special effects whatsoever, like everything would be green screen. They would, in order to get it something, uh, to something presentable, it sounds like they would want, it sounds like they want to put in like 20 million bucks right. to give you an idea. And, you know, I guess at that point they're like, well, this movie's already in the hole. And, you know, I guess there's no faith that this incarnation of the movie would add anything more to pulling it out of debt. But I would sure love to see it. And I would sure, you know, I'm, I hold out hope. And I've read so many articles like, you know, they're gonna, they're not gonna. But it would be a dream if you know, HBO Max in the first year had the Snyder Cut. You know, I can't imagine, like, yeah. we'd all subscribe, you know, uh, or at least be friends with somebody who subscribed and, you know, watch mm -hmm. through their membership. But I can't imagine it wouldn't create traction and action. Um, but at the same time, it may be for Warner Brothers creates a whole new set of headaches where then you've got a bunch of people going, let them finish, make another one. And they're like, oh, my God, like, if we went from release the Snyder Cut to like, now we got to give them a whole new movie. And that's, you know, if I ran a studio and I had all the money, honestly, I would. I, I would let that man finish his story. He had a vision. And whether you like that vision or not, so few people in this business bring any vision to any of their storytelling. You know what I'm saying? And his was yeah. operatic. It was very huge. And like I've said many times, like, and I'm not saying this to bring it down, but there are some things that didn't hit me in the way where I'm like, well, that's not Batman that I know, or that's not Superman I know and stuff like that. But those are the same quibbles I would have reading a comic book that kind of took the character left or right or something like that. So it always breaks my heart whenever that story comes up because, I, you know, I know it's like this is first world problems and stuff like that. But like, there's a felt scrape everything away, scrape away, you know, that it's DC, scrape away that the you know the problems that they had making the movie the reception of batman v superman and stuff like that scrape the scrape away everything and all you're left with for me is the story of an artist 
who haunted, wanted to tell his story and was in process of doing that and was making a lot of people happy by telling that story and then yeah. just instantly got shut down right. and there's no more, com it, like the place that was financing it wants no more conversation about. It. That's heartbreaking. Yes, this is a first world problem, right? Like it's not like somebody's starving or something that like, but still it's, that was his song. And, and man, yeah. like I spoke to him during those years. Like when I did a Man of Steel event for like Yahoo, I think it was when I went to video and he was heading off to do Batman v Superman. And he showed me a picture of the suit in advance. And he was like a, like a child at Christmas, a kid in the candy store. He was excited as hell. He wasn't like dark and grim or something like that. I'm going to make the darkest version of DC movie you ever saw or anything. Like, he was a kid. He was just like, I can't wait. Such enthusiasm. You rarely see that kind of passion in a filmmaker. You know, Kevin Feige, as a grand filmmaker who's produced the entire Marvel Universe, he has that kind of passion. We talk to him and he, this is a guy who lives and breathes this stuff. He's one of us. And while Zach maybe wouldn't be technically described as one of us in as much as he didn't grow up reading the same comics we did, or maybe he has a different take on the material, he is inherently one of us because he sees the special nature of these stories. And he's like, this is what they are through my prism. Mm -hmm. And his prism was like, interesting for better or worse, whether you loved it or whether you hated it. It was a vision. He, yeah. he had a take, like yeah. how few people in this world have a take at all, let alone a new take on something you're familiar with. And so like, I would love to see him finish. I doubt we're gonna see that in this lifetime, but stranger things have happened. If you had told me a year ago that one day we'd all be like locked in our houses, uh, you know, for a long period of time, I'd be like, yeah, right. Would you, would you watch that Steven right. Soderbergh movie, Contagion? Yeah. Like, and here we are. So maybe there's a world where we do get to see the Snyder Cut and I'm fully in support of that. Not only do I want them to release the Snyder Cut, I want them to give a lot, him a lot of movie, make up for the Snyder Cut, and or the Snyder Cut, if you will, and let him make the other Justice League movie. There were going to be two. Yeah. Like, it was a part one and part two. And then after, I think, BBS, suddenly it started truncating into one movie instead. And it sounded like, the way I get it, Steppenwolf was the first movie, and then it ends with Dark Side showing up, and then the whole next movie is the huge movie is yes. like you know their end game if you will where you're battling dark side so break them off some more money man let them go make that movie why not we're all we're, we're never going to go out to a movie theater again apparently according to the experts so you know we're all going to be home give us that yeah i that i mean we need that right now i think i mean if anything could cheer people up like especially dc fans it would be releasing the snyder cut so if it's out there this is a great time to release it i think um, real quick, we were talking to Todd McFarlane yesterday, uh, and he told us that he's having Zoom meetings again about the Salmon Twitch TV show. Is there anything that you could tell us about that? Do you know? It might be a version, like, without me, because he didn't call me or anything like that. I mean, it's well, his property. So maybe it's very point, recent. It's very recent. He had, uh, I think, uh, who had done the deal? I came into that because it was uh, BBC had licensed it. Um, the woman who was running BBC had worked at uh, Dick Wolf's company, I think it was, and because I found this so strange. At one point, Dick Wolf wanted to do a Sam and Twitch show. Like, and Dick Wolf, as we all know, does like Law and Order in Chicago, this and that, but like right. no comic book stuff. So I was like, wow, is that true? And she said, yeah, but like it didn't wind up happening. So she went on to like be creative or run creative at BBC. And she remembered Sam and Twitch. She loved it as a property. And so she reached out to Todd and Todd was like, yeah, I'll give you a license. Go ahead. If you can make a show, feel free. So uh, she had reached out uh, to me and, and uh, I had a pitch on the show and they liked it. And so we kind of moved forward and developed and stuff. And then, you know, uh, Todd gave his blessing. He was building the Spawn movie and, and saying that he was using twitch in spawn the movie as well but like these things could coexist and we were like hey man we all understand there are dc movies and dc tv shows so, so that's they would totally have, they would have been two separate properties then two very separate entities so his twitch and in, in the movie is a famous person and our twitch would have been either a newcomer or in my heart it was dave desmolchin that's who i wanted as, as twitch so um we went deep with bbc uh, and we were meant to be, that's what uh, we were being groomed for, uh, the show that would take over uh, when Orphan Black finished. Not, we weren't going to be as good as Orphan Black, but like when Orphan Black's run was done, 
the next show they wanted to stick into the slot was going to be perhaps Sam and Twitch. And then BBC cut their budgets and like stopped production on Dirk Gently and stuff like that. And since the belt and suddenly Sam and Twitch went out the window. So I think at this point, the rights to Sam and Twitch probably have reverted back to Todd. Mm-hmm. And now Todd is probably taking Sam and Twitch, as is his absolute right, they're his characters, um, out into the world in a different way, if that's what he's talking about, Zooms. But it doesn't in- in- involve me. Well, um, I thank you very much for being so gracious with your time. Before I let you go, can I... I just want to ask about He-Man. Can I talk about He-Man for just a second? Yeah, but I'll tell you what, you're not going to get a few minutes. We'll go another half hour, but I'm happy to as talk long about as you, it. As long as you want to go, I'll, I'll stick here with you. I'm happy I, to talk I to wish, you. I wish to God I could share the animatics with you. We've, we've now seen three animatics for the show. Mm-hmm. Um, powerhouse animation, uh, absolutely killing it. For those that don't follow or don't know the jargon, animatic is kind of like a visual storyboard or moving storyboard of the show, pre-visualization. So uh, it's a black and white rendition kind of of what the show is going to look like. There's no color, it's early drawings and stuff. So it gives you a rough idea and it has the vocal tracks laid out more importantly. So all the cast that you've uh, recorded and we've got an incredible cast with Chris Wood and Sarah Michelle Gellar. And oh yeah, the, ca- and the cast Mark is amazing. Hamill. Cast is yeah. nuts. So we've got all those voices now recorded and they take those voices and put them against the drawings. And the drawings aren't quite lip flapping, animated perfect. Sometimes there's still drawings, but it's a moving version of the story. And you can get your timing done and you can definitely see what the show will eventually look like. Right. Now, nobody would ever release the animatic, uh, no artist, because they're like, you, they don't want to share the raw vision. They want you to see the finished. But I sure. swear to you, as somebody who can't draw, these animatics are so fucking good we could put this on Netflix and people would watch it and be like, well, next time do color, but this is amazing. The art is fantastic. Uh, The design work that these cats have done, the animation that that Powerhouse has done, absolutely spellbinding. These are the cats that do Castlevania, Seis Manos and stuff. And so it's in the style of what, you know, an anime style is, I think it's called the Netflix anime original, but so it looks it's... exactly like our classic characters. Nobody's been redesigned where you're like, oh, that's the 2020 version. Like they all right. look like they're supposed to. And the story we, it functions as essentially the next episode when they stopped. Like it's not like the, awesome. we begin right, kind, not right where the left off because they were very episodic. But we begin where they ended, the same tone and everything like that. And then our tone shifts as something cataclysmic happens. And that's where our story kind of kicked, the modern story kicks in. But even then, it's not like, and everything you know about He-Man is wrong. Like, we're we're gonna upend the universe. Everything you know about He-Man, you need to know in order to watch the show because we play thick and fast with mythology. That was part of the thrills of being able to do this job is being handed a world full of IP, like Mattel's uh, Masters of the Universe line, and then being able to go like hog wild, telling like a grown up story. And I don't mean a grown up story, I mean this ain't for kids. I mean, Teddy, who's our exec at Netflix, and he's our patron saint. Like when when, uh, this came to Netflix, it came to Netflix because of Teddy, because Teddy says like, this is my, Batman. This is my Star Wars. I love all that stuff, but this is my number one. I I love Masters of the Universe, or Motu, as we call it. And Mm -hmm. he goes, all I ask that you do with this is treat it as seriously as I treated it when I watched it as a kid. He's going, I thought the stakes were high. I thought He-Man was always about to be killed by Skeletor. And I, that's, that's the show I watched. The older I got, I realized, you know, it was for kids and maybe not as dire as I thought. And he's going, but what I want to bring is a show where there are people like feel that the stakes are real, that they care deeply about these characters. He was so committed and gave us license to create a, like a Game of Thrones version of, Ma- of Masters Universe minus the nudity and, you know, dragons. But like how, you know, that was set in a world of swords and sorcery, which prior to Game of Thrones, people outside the uh, genre would be dismissive of. Then it became one of the biggest shows on TV where even people who never picked up a fantasy book never went to a Comic-Con in their lives 
would sit down and watch this this magic dragon show and stuff like that. Yeah. So we we uh like it's I love it. It was one one of my favorite jobs I've ever had in my life. It went from being a job where like they hired me to be a showrunner to being an absolute passion where I'm like I I don't know if I could ever have another job after this again like that will ever coalesce the writing is phenomenal mark bernardin came over from fat man beyond uh dia is one of our writers tim is one of our writers uh eric crosco wrote a bunch of scripts uh for supergirl uh, a few of which that i directed and all of us were you know hardcore like let's world build and you know our yeah. model to be honest was the marvel universe movies where we're like okay they do this so well here and that's what a writer's room does Writer's Room comes up with new stories by talking about a bunch of old stories that they love. So we sat there going, ooh, remember when they did this in Iron Man? We could totally do this moment here, but it's in our version with these characters and stuff. That right. was fantastic. We built this really great universe-spanning story, cataclysmic story that's like meant to be the, the last, like the original title for the series was End of the Universe. Um, so it's, it's, it has this gravitas to it, but it's still all about what that show was. Like at the end of the day, that show really wasn't about people fighting because they've never clashed swords because it was a good right. show. It was about relating. It was about relationships. And that's what ours is. Like we don't have that amazing cast just because they're like, oh, I like Skeletor. Is because we gave them scripts with dialogue that they can like pour all over them. And there's so much rich dialogue. So much so that like, when powerhouse goes to work and brings their magic mm -hmm. you're like oh my god we got to cut some of this dialogue because you just want to see the glory like they can do things in this version of the cartoon like have a sword fight stab a yeah. person people can die and stuff so it's thrilling yeah i'm telling you we get, we're gonna have to wait until 2021 but people will be completely happy with what we've done with with that being said, uh, does that mean that everything's still on track, though, with the production and everything? It's it's good to go? Here's a little uh, inside, inside. I mean, you don't even have to be a Hollywood insider to figure this out. Um, in a world where everything's shut down and you can't go to a movie set or stand there on TV or shoot anything because everything's shut down, animation is a very solitary act made by many solitary people all over the world. So. Right. Masters of the Universe has continued completely unabated. We haven't been able to record the last three episodes, mm -hmm. but we weren't scheduled to record those until June anyway. So schedule-wise, nice. our records are totally fine. And then animation-wise, they're still we're in good shape. Uh, oh, sorry. We're in good shape no there. Worries. Right now animation is like the business to be in man because uh scott Mosier, who i do smodcast with uh, he directed the grinch movie the last one that came out co-directed that he said like he knows people that work at tip mouse the the animation house they're just getting phone calls left and right from every network from every streamer going what do you have sitting on your shelf just give it to us right now because everyone needs content and they're not going to be able to make new shows for, for who knows why, however long we can go back to work. But animation, you could totally do at home, so to speak. You don't have to go into an office. You don't have to go to a set and be around right. 100 people making something pretend. You can be doing all the lion's uh, share of the work, the heavy lifting, the animating, all throughout this process. You know, even without, you know, animators use a scratch track. So if you don't have your main star voice, you throw down a scratch track and you're working through all this time, man. So that's one of the reasons, like, we're going to try to go pitch the uh, rebooting the Clerks cartoon, man. Because I'm yes. like, we could just, that's turnkey. We got all the designs done. We just, like, start making new episodes. Let's do it. All right, so I know that there's, like, a, supposed to be another He-Man series that Netflix is, is working on that's yeah. from this one. Are you worried at all about people confusing those or is there like a race to try to beat that one out or anything like that not at all there there are brother show sister show whatever you'd call it we are the 2d show they are the 3d so their show looks like a pixar movie you know it's uh, it's cg um their show is also aimed a bit younger um it's it's a really a kid show so essentially they're going after the audience that used to watch the age group that used to watch He-Man in the 80s. Um, whereas ours was conceived, and not by me, but like by uh, Rob David at Mattel, who wrote uh, 
Masters of the Universe books for DC Comics. So not only does he work there, but he puts his money where his mouth is. And uh, Teddy at Netflix, they were the ones that kind of come up with the idea of doing this incarnation was, the, was let's make something that the hardcore fan who grew up watching Masters of the Universe yeah. will recognize and know as their own. So this was conceived from start to finish by a fan, Teddy, as a fan series. He's like, look, well, no matter, I understand we're doing a kid's show. He's like, and I understand they're making a movie someplace. He's going, but here, I would just like to continue what I grew up watching and make something for me, for the people that like me grew up and like, oh, I love that show. Like he, he's like, if I watch it and he goes to PowerCon every year and stuff, he's like, I know there's an audience there. So we were designed specifically to go for you, to go for me. And then while we're watching it, we're like, hey, come over here. And we bring our kid because they're kid friendly and stuff. And we're like, this is the show that I used to watch when I was a kid. And then it becomes multi-generational and stuff. Right. So the, the 2D one is, that's what our, our manifest is. The 3D one, that's their, you know, they're going after the most important audience in the world, the children. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. I can't wait. Uh... Speaking as a that He Man was like the first superhero that I ever watched, like as a little little kid. So so we've gotten way too much Transformers stuff lately. I, uh, I it's about time we got some He Man stuff, man. I'm super psyched this is, for it. This is only the opening salvo, I think, because somebody wants to make a movie and stuff like that. But there's been like this starvation period in the marketplace. You know what was the 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 last He Man incarnation? I think was was the Mike. Lee one, the Mike Young one, that the one that they it was a few years ago. Yeah, I, what that was, that was that also like, very. That was like two thousand two or something like that. It's been a while. Two thousand two. So you're going yeah. back like a couple of years. So aside from putting out classic figures or redo of the classic figures and stuff, this would be the first the 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 three D show and the two D show, both of which are on Netflix. That'll be the first like, hey world, remember He Man? Hey, we're back, and that kind of was conceived as paving the way for the big budget movie that would follow next. And, you know, if you want to kind of fertilize the earth, make sure there are people out there, make sure they're familiar with the concept. And that was kind of our job is to like retell the He-Man story. Don't reinvent it. Like the movie can take care of that. Like you guys tell a story in modern times with the characters that everyone loves and recognize. And mm -hmm. that was our only manifest. And after that, it was like, come up with any story you want. And it, man, the cast knocked it out the park because we have some wordy, chatty scripts, but we've got some amazing vocal talent to like bust out those lines. And I'm not, I mean, this, don't, this ain't saying anything more because I, I cry at everything, but I cried reading a script yesterday for episode five, just reading the words on the page, man, the dialogue that has to be spoken, uh, that absolutely destroyed me. Like it, it, there's heart in it, that there's adventure in it, um, it, there's laughs in it. There's a lot of nostalgia in it. I'm telling you, it's Marvel movies were our model, and I think we did yeah. Kevin Foggy proud, even though he's not working on it. <laughs> I'm super excited. Uh, last question, just for fun, since we're comicbook.com, uh, if you could direct any Marvel or DC movie, no matter how minor the character, what would be your dream project? Um, I don't have one because those movies are complicated. Uh, they yeah. look very hard. Watch those behind the scenes things. And like the Russo brothers worked for a year on Endgame. And it's worth it because that movie's amazing. But I don't have that kind of talent or tolerance or patience. Oh, that's, that's not true. Don't, don't say yourself do short it, like that. You're so humble. My You're very sweet. But my dream, more so than making one of those movies, would be if they called me up and they were like, would you like to be in one of those movies? That's the dream, man, because I'm not like, I don't consider myself an actor, but I, those Marvel movies, that's that's my soap operas. Like, I love those. It's my go-to happy place. I just rewatched uh, 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 Infinity War yesterday. So like, and Black Panther as well. So if they were like, oh, come be in one, that would mean more to me than them being like, come direct one. If they said, come direct one, I'd be like, I don't know, that what seems about hard. One? Would you want to write one? Even that seems hard, because honestly, like, I consider myself a good writer or whatever for Kevin Smith, but, like, I couldn't do what Marcus and McFeely did with, with Endgame and with uh, Infinity War scripts and all the scripts that they wrote. Like, that's a specialized talent. And I'll tell you how I know it's talent, because I know how the sausage is made. I know how to make things. I know how you put a line here and a line here and it'll invoke an emotion in somebody. I, 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 
I get it. I've been to the circus. I've run a circus. So that shit shouldn't work on me. And yet when I walk into those movies, they absolutely work. They pull the wool over the eyes of somebody who knows that this is all a trick and who yeah. should know better and stuff. That's a specialized kind of writing that I can't do. So I, I wouldn't even want it. That seems too hard for me and, and seems like a talent I don't have. Put me in them. I, I can pull that off, particularly if they give me no lines whatsoever. Right. Well, you're clearly uh, more passionate than a lot of filmmakers about this stuff. So I think Marvel and DC would be uh, just lucky to have you. Uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We've already gone over. Thank you so, so much for sitting and talking to me. And I hope you stay safe and keep fasting during quarantine. I don't know how you're doing it so well. So far, so good. I just wanted to remind, I'm a fan of the organization. What up? Oh, look at that's what one of the OG up? shirts. And that wasn't just me showing off my tits. That was me showing off the love. Not, I mean, Thanks, either guys. or. Either or. Even if there either was no or, shirt plus on a it. little. There was a, I was trying for a little nip slip. I thought that would be controversial <laughs> on the internet. Didn't work out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. See you later. Great talking. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.